Welcome to the Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. Here are this week's top headlines in the crypto news. Squid Game Scam, the shady crypto that went up 450x and back to zero. What went down and how to spot these kinds of crypto scams. Metaverse Madness. Microsoft and Nike unveil their own metaverse plans, while metaverse cryptos raise millions. Is it just hype or something more? Crypto Workers Wanted. Amazon Web Services posts a new crypto job as banks beg for crypto talent. Wait until you hear who's hiring them all. Australia's Crypto Adoption. The Commonwealth Bank of Australia allows millions of Aussies to access cryptocurrencies from directly within their bank accounts, and an Australian crypto ETF breaks records. What comes next? Ethereum's ultrasound money. ETH becomes deflationary for the first week ever. When could we see another all-time high? Tokenized Community Trust. Reddit details its plans to tokenize Karma on Ethereum, potentially onboarding over 500 million users. Is the flippening imminent? Stablecoin regulation revealed. The President's Working Group on Financial Markets calls on politicians to crack down on stablecoins, or else they will step in and do it themselves. Why this news isn't as bearish as it seems. Infrastructure bill becomes law, but the crypto market hasn't crashed. Have the problematic provisions been priced in? Countdown to the stock slump begins. The Federal Reserve announces its plans to reduce purchases of government bonds. Here's what that means for the crypto market. And a closer look at the correction that just won't come in this week's crypto market forecast. All this and more in just a moment. Good morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Guy and what you're about to see is educational content, not financial advice. You can find any topics you're looking for using the timestamps in the video timeline. And now for today's top stories. Last week, we saw yet another rug pull on the Binance Smart Chain. This time, the crypto in question was the Squid token belonging to the Squid Game cryptocurrency project. For those unfamiliar, if any, Squid Game is a popular Netflix TV show wherein people in debt voluntarily sign up for a series of deadly children's games to make money. Naturally, the Squid Game cryptocurrency, which is not affiliated with the Netflix show in any way, claimed it would recreate the same sort of challenges, with the Squid token as the centerpiece required to play. Shortly after Squid began trading on the PancakeSwap decks, Squid holders realized they weren't able to sell. This inability to sell caused the price of Squid to go up, with each additional unsuspecting investor, which attracted more unsuspecting investors, creating a parabolic run that pushed Squid to a price of nearly $3,000. Then, on November the 1st, the price of Squid crashed down to less than a cent in a matter of minutes, as the developers ran off with the cryptocurrency that had been deposited into Squid's various pools on PancakeSwap. The exact amount of crypto taken is unknown, but is estimated to be over $3 million worth. Binance is investigating the incident. According to the Binance Smart Chain Explorer, over 110,000 people bought Squid, meaning over 110,000 people got wrecked. The sad part is that many people were pointing out that this was an obvious rug pull due to red flags such as fake team members, spelling mistakes in the white paper, and fake partnerships. The worst part is that the Squid Game cryptocurrency was promoted by multiple mainstream media outlets such as the BBC and CNBC during its rise, which lured in even more investors. And if that wasn't crazy enough, the Squid token continues to trade and even went up by 10x over the weekend, meaning that some people are still piling in. CoinMarketCap also suggests that Squid's 24-hour trading volume is more than 300 million, which makes absolutely no sense. Now, it should go without saying that you should always exercise extreme caution when confronted with a crypto project that uses a popular brand to get attention. The best defense against crypto scams is to do your own research and question everything you find. I have a video in the description that teaches you how to research cryptocurrencies if you need it. Meanwhile, in the metaverse, Microsoft has announced its plans to create a metaverse of its own, starting with the popular Microsoft Teams Office communication platform. 
The Microsoft Teams metaverse is titled Mesh, and it will, of course, feature avatars that can meet in office type settings to do office type things, except you're not actually in an office. Sounds like a nightmare to me. Anyways, Mesh is expected to roll out in 2022, and between now and then, it sounds like Microsoft has plans to announce an informal metaverse world for Xbox. There aren't any details about that as of yet, but comments by Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella suggest that Xbox is looking to make existing games, such as Minecraft, more immersive by introducing elements of virtual reality. Clothing brand Nike also subtly submitted a few trademark applications related to the metaverse and is even looking to hire two people to help bring the Nike brand to metaverse worlds. Nike will be selling virtual clothing as part of its metaverse push, and this has led some to speculate that the company is trying to make up for losses due to supply chain issues, which it admits have hit its bottom line. In any case, it sounds like it will only be a matter of time before we see a Nike store open up in Decentraland, especially since a plot of land was purchased earlier this year to build a virtual mall in Decentraland's virtual world. Crypto investors seem to be aware of the potential for corporate crypto crossovers because they've been piling hundreds of millions of dollars into metaverse projects. For starters, there's the Sandbox, which raised $93 million on Monday. EngineCoin also announced a $100 million metaverse fund, which focuses on cross-chain metaverse integrations. Even FTX and Solana pledged $100 million to gaming-oriented crypto projects, which includes metaverse under its umbrella. All this investment seems to suggest that this metaverse push is a long-term affair and not a passing fad. I reckon that's a reasonable assumption to make, simply because cryptocurrency itself is no passing fad, and it looks like legacy players are starting to realize this. Over the last few months, we've seen dozens of crypto job postings from big companies, and the latest addition to this list is Amazon Web Services, which is looking to hire a financial services specialist. The ideal candidate for this position must have extensive knowledge of cryptocurrencies, non-fungible tokens, stablecoins, central bank digital currencies, and at least 10 years' experience. According to a recent LinkedIn report, the number of blockchain jobs available has increased more than 6x since August last year. We should know, as the Coin Bureau is also on the lookout for talent. Now, interestingly, the largest employers of crypto professionals outside of the crypto industry are apparently Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Fidelity, and JP Morgan Chase. These big banks have been offering up to 50% higher salaries for any crypto talent that comes their way, and this is basically because they're desperate to keep the bank accounts of their clients full. As I've mentioned many times before, banks have found themselves in competition with cryptocurrency exchanges like Coinbase and stablecoin issuers like Circle, which are siphoning billions of dollars from bank balance sheets. This is because trust in fiat is at an all-time low thanks to inflation being at all-time highs, and the yields on digital dollars offered in DeFi can't be provided by centralized institutions. This is why we've seen banks around the world introduce crypto trading, crypto custody, and in some cases, even crypto staking for their clients. Having everything in-house means that money never leaves to an exchange or stablecoin issuer. The Commonwealth Bank of Australia is the largest bank to jump on board with its announcement that it will be offering Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin trading in the mobile banking apps of its 6.5 million clients. This is thanks to a partnership with the Gemini cryptocurrency exchange and Chainalysis, which will of course be tracking all the crypto transactions being made by the CBA's clients. The CBA will be running a pilot for its crypto trading program for the next few weeks before a full-scale rollout in early 2022. Now, the reason why this announcement is so significant is because the Commonwealth Bank of Australia is the largest bank in the country, and it has typically been seen as a trendsetter. This is why some analysts believe the other three of the big four banks will soon follow suit with crypto services of their own. If this happens, the average Australian will have easy access to cryptocurrency, and it's clear the demand for crypto among Aussies couldn't be higher. Last Monday, a crypto company ETF that listed on the Australian Securities Exchange broke records on its first day of trading, with over $30 million flowing into the fund. The ETF is called the Capital Appreciation Portfolio Diversification and goes by the ticker CRYP. C -R -Y -P. 
It tracks the stocks of publicly traded companies that hold crypto, including Coinbase and MicroStrategy. As I mentioned in last week's crypto review, Australia's securities regulator has signaled its readiness to approve a physically backed Bitcoin ETF as soon as robust crypto custody solutions are put in place. The success of the Crypt ETF suggests that a physically backed Bitcoin ETF listing could be moments away, and some analysts believe a physically backed Ethereum ETF would follow shortly afterwards. Speaking of Ethereum, ETH saw its first deflationary week ever since the EIP-1559 upgrade in August. For those unfamiliar, EIP-1559 introduced partial transaction fee burns, meaning a portion of the ETH is burned and the remainder goes to the cryptocurrency miner who processed the transaction. Prior to EIP-1559, ETH's inflation was around 4% per year, which meant it wasn't the best store of value as far as cryptocurrencies go. However, the introduction of EIP-1559 has many investors calling ETH ultrasound money, because if more ETH is being destroyed than is being issued, basic economics dictates the existing ETH will be worth more. Ultrasound money happens to be the name of the website where you can track ETH's inflation, or lack thereof, and I'll leave a link to it in the description if you're interested. Many Ethereum developers, including Anthony Sassano, were shocked by ETH's deflationary flip, noting that this is not something they expected to happen until Ethereum switched to proof-of-stake in early 2022. You can actually simulate ETH's inflation on ultrasound money, and it currently projects that ETH's supply would diminish at a rate of 2% per year with Ethereum 2.0 under current network conditions. I will be covering all of this in an upcoming video on Ethereum, so stay tuned for that. Even though ETH's emission has flipped back to being inflationary, I reckon ETH's issuance is being suppressed enough to facilitate a new all-time high. As I'm recording this, ETH's price is already on the edge of another new all-time high, and my technical analysis suggests we could go up to 4900 in the coming days. Bigger gains are on the books for ETH long-term, and this is because of the exponential adoption Ethereum has seen since its release. It looks like we're about to enter the parabolic phase, because Reddit has announced that it will be tokenizing its Karma points as ERC-20 tokens. Given that Reddit has over 500 million users, this obviously isn't feasible to do directly on Ethereum, which is why Reddit will be using the Arbitrum scaling solution for its grand crypto plan. Reddit is currently testing tokenized karma in two subreddits with some 80,000 users, and if successful, will begin onboarding the remaining hundreds of millions. No exact dates have been defined. Now, in case you haven't put two and two together, this means that there will be 500 million users added to Ethereum. Ethereum currently has 151 million unique wallet addresses and counting, which is nearly twice as many unique wallet addresses as Bitcoin. This begs the question of whether this is the catalyst which will see Ethereum flip Bitcoin by market cap, making ETH the largest cryptocurrency. This ultimately depends on how much demand for ETH Reddit's tokenized Karma creates. Most of the Karma token's activity will probably stay on Arbitrum due to its near non-existent gas fees, and that means that there might not be any significant buying pressure for ETH in this equation. That said, Reddit's move could embolden other companies to follow suit, and if Arbitrum proves itself to be capable of scaling to hundreds of millions of users, we could see some other use cases emerge that do drive demand for ETH. The perfect candidate for a demand driver for ETH would be a new and improved decentralized stablecoin, and this is needed now more than ever as regulators rein in centralized stablecoins. The President's Working Group on Financial Markets, or PWG, has finally released its stablecoin report, and here are a few of the key takeaways. For starters, the only stablecoin that really seems to be at risk is Tether, and this is primarily because of the assets backing USDT. As I mentioned in my video about the assets backing the biggest stablecoins, they're all backed mainly by debt of some kind, and in the case of USDT, a substantial portion is risky corporate debt. Besides ensuring all stablecoins are backed by high-quality liquid assets, the PWG wants stablecoin issuers to be subject to the same regulations as banks. Now, funnily enough, Circle is already planning to turn itself into a bank, meaning USDC should be safe from any severe crackdowns. Similarly, Paxos, which issues BUSD, 
and the recently rebranded USDP is fully insured. And asset insurance is also something the PWG wants stablecoin issuers to have. The only concerning part of the report is that it passes the hot potato to politicians in Congress and demands they act in a timely manner or else the regulators will step in and do what they do best. The only question is when the constituents of the PWG will begin cracking their whip, and it looks like this won't be happening anytime soon. Now, I'll be covering the PWG stablecoin report later this week, and all I'll say for now is that the rabbit hole goes damn deep with this one, so be sure to keep your eyes peeled for that video. Another apparently bearish development that happened last week was the passing of the infamous Infrastructure Bill, which contains problematic tax reporting clauses that could crush certain sectors of the crypto industry. Now, I say apparently because the crypto market didn't flinch on the news. In fact, many cryptocurrencies are hitting all-time highs. This seems to suggest that the passing of the infrastructure bill was already priced into the crypto market, but there are two other possibilities. Firstly, the provisions in the infrastructure bill don't go into force until 2024, something which I mentioned in my weekly newsletter. This means the threat is far enough in the future that it's having no effect on the present. Second, the infrastructure bill includes over $1 trillion of government spending, and even though this money is supposed to make its way into things like roads, internet, and public transport, it's likely that some of it will bleed into stocks and even cryptocurrencies. Even though that $1 trillion isn't here yet, chances are that some of the individuals and institutions which will be on the receiving end of this capital can broker a deal with the bank to give them some of that cash in advance, assuming all the paperwork has been signed for that future cash. Not only that, but the House also passed the Build Back Better bill, which is heading for the Senate. If this also passes, it's possible that the individuals and institutions on the receiving end of that capital will have a way to access it in advance once that bill becomes law. In other words, although the infrastructure bill is objectively bad for crypto, this is offset by the trillions of dollars of indirect stimulus money that will make its way into asset markets. It looks like there's only one thing that can crash the crypto market now, and that's the Federal Reserve, which announced last week that it will be reducing its purchases of government bonds. For those unfamiliar, interest rates for saving and borrowing are determined in large part by the demand for government bonds or lack thereof. If demand for government bonds is high, interest rates are low. And if demand for government bonds is low, interest rates are high. The Federal Reserve has been buying $120 billion worth of government bonds every month, almost since the pandemic began. This has helped keep demand for bonds high and interest rates low. Now, low interest rates have incentivized individuals and institutions to borrow and spend, which is what you want to stimulate a weak economy recovering from a pandemic. The problem is that the amount of leverage, aka money being borrowed to invest, is at an all-time high. And it was already pretty high before that too, because interest rates have been pretty low for over a decade. Now, the Federal Reserve has begun tapering, that is, reducing its purchases of government bonds to the tune of $15 billion a month until they hit zero, which will be in June next year. On paper, this should increase interest rates, meaning all those individuals and institutions who have borrowed beyond their means might have to start selling assets to cover their monthly debt payments, which have gone up as a result of the increased interest rates. As I mentioned in my video about what affects the price of Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies are seen as a risky asset class, and this means BTC, ETH, and all the others will be the first to go if investors are forced to sell assets to cover debts. More importantly, the whole reason why the Federal Reserve is indirectly raising interest rates is because of runaway inflation, which could turn into hyperinflation if left unchecked. Investors, and especially institutional investors, see BTC as an inflation hedge. And if the Federal Reserve's tapering does manage to bring inflation under control, investors could start dumping BTC as a result. Now, this sounds pretty grim, but history suggests that the Federal Reserve's taper won't last long. This is because every time interest rates rose too quickly, the stock market crashed, and the Federal Reserve's reaction was to turn the money printer back on and buy government bonds again. We'll have to see just how much of an effect the Federal Reserve's tapering will have on the crypto market in the coming months, but rest assured that if a crash does happen, it will be widespread enough that the Federal Reserve will reverse course 
and this will allow the crypto market to continue its rally. Turning to the charts, we can see that BTC continues to move sideways, which is bad news for BTC holders, but very good news for any altcoin holders. When BTC is consolidating like this, investors start getting bored and begin speculating with altcoins. This can be seen in the Bitcoin Dominance Index, which has dropped significantly over the last week. If this continues, we will see many altcoins hit new all-time highs, which is good news for altcoin holders, but bad news for the crypto market as a whole, since a big drop in Bitcoin dominance has signaled the end of the bull market in previous cycles. Luckily, we're nowhere near that level yet, but it's definitely something to keep your eye on as we're trending very aggressively in that direction. This week's winners are Loopring, Crypto.com Coin, The Sandbox, Helium, and Arweave, a solid lineup to say the least. Loopring's LRC token is up on the rumor that Loopring will be the Ethereum Layer 2 that GameStop will be leveraging for its upcoming NFTs. This is because GameStop recently hired Loopring's former head of business as part of its crypto expansion. LRC is looking like it could pump again, but there's a lot of profit taking as revealed by the long wicks at the top of the daily candles. This profit taking makes sense given that LRC is still a long way away from its 2017 high something that many good cryptocurrencies are unfortunately struggling with. Conversely, Crypto.com's CRO coin has no previous price resistance and continues to post new all-time highs. This is for a few reasons, namely the popularity of the Crypto.com app and the launch of the Kronos mainnet, which will introduce smart contracts to the native CRO chain. CRO also recently listed on Coinbase, which was something of a surprise given that the SEC considers it to be a security as it's similar to a stock in Crypto.com. And then I remembered that Coinbase just listed CRO as an ERC-20, which seems to be a loophole to listing these kinds of coins. To be blunt, I'm not entirely sure where CRO is headed next as its tokenomics are quite complex. When I get around to doing an update video for CRO, I'll let you know. On that note, the Sandbox is another cryptocurrency I'll be covering later this week, and Sand is rallying for reasons I mentioned earlier, namely hype around the metaverse and that $93 million raise. I must admit that I was wrong about Sand biting the dust right away, but I reckon we're still clearly on the decline. Zooming out shows just how unsustainable this price pump is, so I would be very cautious about buying Sand at this time. Not financial advice, of course. Helium's HNT, on the other hand, seems to be in a more sustainable uptrend, and this is because of the rollout of Helium's new peer-to-peer -peer 5G network. I won't get into the details here, but I strongly recommend watching my recent video about the project, and that will be down in the description. And last, but certainly not least, we have Arweave, whose AR coin is rallying because of all the activity on Solana. This is because Arweave stores all of Solana's blockchain data, so the more Solana is used, the more AR goes up in value as Solana automatically buys AR to store its blockchain data on Arweave. Assuming Sol continues on its current trajectory, AR will continue to rise along with it. As you guys know, I hold both AR and HNT in my personal portfolio, so I am really enjoying those gains. And that's all for today's Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. If you enjoyed it, folks, you know what to do hit that like button, subscribe button, and bell icon too. If you want more of me, head on over to Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram to get a sneak peek behind the scenes. If you join my Telegram channel, you'll get the daily crypto updates you crave, and signing up for my weekly newsletter is a great way to get the tools, tips, and tricks you need to get paid. And of course, you can support the channel by heading over to the Coin Bureau merch store and picking up a shirt or hoodie or both. Links to all these resources are in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in next week's episode.